Welcome to the Sports Tech Nation Summit. My name is Wayne Kimmel, and I'm the host of this panel where we're going to bring on two leading sports betting executives to talk about all the incredible things that are happening across sports betting and sports wagering across the United States. One of the panelists today is Matthew Holt. He is the CEO of U.S. Integrity. And our other panelist is Dylan Robbins, the CEO of Lucre Sports. Welcome, guys. Thanks for having Thanks, us. Thanks, Wayne. Well, excited to have both of you. And again, if you don't know me, I'm Wayne Kimmel, the managing partner of 76 Capital. We are the sports tech venture capital fund that invests across the sports betting industry, the esports industry, and the sports tech industry in general. And I'm really excited to be the host for this panel today. This panel is, I'm so excited about this, guys. You know, this panel is going out to over 4,800 people. Uh, we're, this will be across, you know, we're doing this across 70 different states. So um, no pressure there, guys. And we've got some, I'm excited for to hear from, from both of you. So Matt, let's kick this off. Um, Matt, from a U.S. integrity perspective, why don't you share with our audience what U.S. integrity is? And, 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 then, and then we'll jump into um, Dylan. You'll do the same thing for Lucra. Sure. So U.S. Integrity is a game integrity, fraud prevention and sports betting compliance firm. Uh, you know, we work with a gambit of clients on, on the regulated sports betting regulator and league team university at conference side. Some of our clients include the NBA, the Pac-12, the Big 12, the SEC, universities like Colorado, Penn State, Pittsburgh, uh, pretty much every regulated sports book across the country, whether it's DraftKings, FanDuel, MGM, Caesars, William Hill, uh, so on and so on. I don't want to name them all. I'll forget some for sure if I try to do it. And regulators in basically every state with legalized sports betting. And we try to identify abnormal abnormalities within wagering, nefarious activity, uh, any types of potential misuse of insider information, match fixing, game manipulation, issues that affect sports books and the consumers as well. And, uh, you know, we're really excited about our positioning sort of in the center of the regulated sports betting universe and, and where we take it from here. Thanks, Matt. Uh, and Dylan, could you do the same thing for, for Lucre Sports? Absolutely. So Lucra is a new and exciting social wagering platform where fans can engage with their friends around live sports. And we're taking the bet, um, pun intended, that people want to wager with their friends. I mean, this is a major lacking opportunity in the sports betting world that there's not enough social interaction. It's not social. It's not approachable. Um, and this is the problem that we're trying to solve. So we've built an easy to use player pl player prop model, you know, Tom Brady versus Aaron Rodgers um, touchdowns or Serena Williams aces versus Steph Curry three pointers, one player. Uh, per person, uh, easy to use contests, and you, know, you bet 10 bucks with your friends. So it's all about that social interaction. It's less about winning money. It's more about that fun that you're going to have with, with your buddies. And we've seen similar you know, trends as Matt's been talking about how regulation and compliance, they're really important to Lucra. Transparency, responsibility, responsible gaming, like that is at the core of what we're doing, especially since we're teaching a lot of novice bettors about wagering for the first time. And so it's at the heart of what we're doing as well. And um, it's been great getting to know Matt in that regard as well. Well, Dylan, that's actually a perfect lead in to my next question. I was going to ask Matt from a U.S. integrity perspective. I mean, Matt, you are, as you said, you've positioned U.S. integrity in the middle of it all across the major operators, the teams, the leagues, the colleges, uh, you know, and and you've, you've put yourself in the middle of an ecosystem of sports that prior to PASPA being overturned in May of 2018, it was only really important in the United States within the state of Nevada, but now with all the states that have now been legalized, what has that been like working with these teams and leagues that were once, I guess, in many cases, enemies to the world of sports betting, but now are some of their biggest supporters and, and allies? It's been a little bit chaotic as I think even the most optimistic um, people out there with their projections wouldn't have guessed that three and a half years in, we'd have 32 states with legalized sports betting, as well as Alberta and Ontario and our neighbors to the north, Puerto Rico opening up regulated sports betting. I mean, we saw a lot of what we thought were aggressive projections that said, hey, we might get to state number 10 in the first three years, and we're already at 32. We'll be at 40 by the end of 2022. 
which is absolutely amazing. So when things are moving this fast, it's really important that people communicate, work together, come together, because we're having to build regs on the fly, regs that we can be proud of, regs that we can stand behind. Um, and integrity is a cornerstone of that. So I, I commend everybody on every side, whether it's the regulators, the operators, the teams, the leagues, everybody really had to come together and embrace this thing and work together to get as far as we've come this fast. And I think everybody's done that. So it's been amazing. So Matt, you know, following up on that, can, can you give maybe a, a concrete example of a, a league or a team or maybe an athletic director that you've worked with has really leaned in and, 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 and how they work with us integrity? Well, I mean, let's just start with a couple of the schools that signed corporate sports betting partnerships already, something that would have been unheard of five years ago, the University of Colorado and LSU University, two major universities coming from the SEC and the Pac-12. Both have corporate partnerships, one with PointsBet, the other with Caesars. And with those corporate partnerships come responsibility, integrity. And so we work with these folks, not just to identify abnormalities with the wagering, not just to identify potential match fixing or point shaving incidents, but to help them build better processes and procedures and best practices on their campus for to help avoid misuse of insider information. You know, the last thing anybody wants is a criminal enterprise being built on their campus, basically to sell nefariously inside information you know and we also then work with them to identify you know safety issues for the student athletes i mean at the end of the day what people don't realize is you know we had an incident with baylor last year when they were on that amazing run where their starting point guard uh you know they're up seven there's a, just a couple seconds to go they're about to win their 30th straight game and they're a seven and a half or eight point favorite and he misses those free throws and rather than going back on campus to this massive celebration hey you won 30 in a row you're number one in the country he got death threats and oh you missed those on purpose how dare you i know you're fixing the game i hope you die and we also have to think of the mental wellness of these of these student athletes so it's educating the student athletes on what betting means to them, educating the coaches and the administrators on what regulated sports betting suddenly meant, means to them, and then being a good partner to help identify any abnormal or nefarious activities so that they can get out in front of them. Well, Dylan, I think that, you know, you're shaking your head a, a bunch yeah. to a lot of things that Matt's saying. Well, yeah, you want to I'd love that? to comment. I mean, so Luca is obviously coming at this from a different standpoint, and we've seen the same things as Matt. So we work with tons of college athletes with the new NIL rules. It's been a huge opportunity for us to, to, to market ourselves for these athletes, to partner with these athletes, to make them a part of our brand. And we're equally focused on that key point of you've got to protect the athletes. And this is such a new space, and there's so much interesting, th so many interesting things happening in this NIL world. Um, and sports betting is 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 at the forefront. And so uh, we're really focused on making sure that everything we do with our athletes is cleared by the same by the schools in the same way. A lot of schools that are working with Matt and U.S. Integrity, we're working with their athletes. Um, and there's just so much change happening. I think what's been really exciting for Lucra is. Um, that this this rising tide of state regulation on the state level um, is has also opened up a lot of doors for lucre on the federal level. I think there's still a lot of federal legislation that's that's in play in our space, um, and lucre as a skill based game is able to operate now in 37 different states um, with the ability for our users to play across state lines, um, which is providing us a really unique opportunity. So, everything that Matt has said, we've been seeing on our side of the market as well, and um, it's a continued focus for us. Well, Dylan, you're certainly shaking things up um, with, yeah. with the, I mean, those kinds of, you know, when you say that to a the, someone tr who's in the traditional sports betting and wagering yeah. world, 37 states across state lines, I mean, that, yeah. that's, that, just, that just sends a chill down people's, right? Look, I mean, these licenses and these skins are really expensive, right? And I think that we watched, it's been amazing to watch. Um, the proliferation of sports betting across these states over the past three and a half years that Matt mentioned, it's, you know, these are behemoth large businesses that are, that are really growing in all these states. And what's really been cool for us about Lucra is we've had an opportunity as a small new growing company to make a splash now in 37 states with our legal infrastructure. Let's be honest, we had to make sacrifices in the product, right? You know, we have player-based betting. Lucra is not the house. We're a much lower margin business. There are, there are trade-offs there. 
But I think it's a huge valuable piece for us to have this large breadth of user base potential uh, in our product. And I do think that it is hopefully sending some notice out in the industry that there's a lot of innovation that still needs to happen. The repeal of PASPA opened this door, but we are in the first inning of innovation. Like we just threw the first pitch. And so it's going to be really exciting to see what happens in the next decade um, as this innovation and regulation kind of have this little teeter potter that is going to continue to happen uh, in our industry. Well, I guess I should do one thing, and I didn't do this at the beginning. I should really share with the fact that 76 Capital is an investor in both your companies, and we think very highly of both you guys. Um, so and I, I got to put that out there. It's kind of like I, I hear you know a lot of times with uh, stock pickers will say that you know yeah. I, my, uh, my, my family foundation or whatever is an investor in the company. I don't know. I see that on uh, Mad Money. He talks to say that stuff. So I'll, I'll do the same thing that Kramer does. But anyway, getting back, getting back to this, Dylan, I want to want to pick up on something that you know I think that has really surprised Matt and me and and others who who are in the, in this industry for a, for a long time is how social it has become, and right. just how social you have actually made you know intentionally your product at Lucra. Yeah, I mean, I think it starts with the leagues, right? And so when you take a step back, it's you know, what do the leagues want? They want more fan engagement. There's a tremendous amount of competition for eyeballs, right? You know, and the leagues used to continually depend on their TV contracts as a huge source of their revenue. And things are changing in that regard. Um, and it's how do you keep your fans more engaged? Well, when it's, you know, 11 to one in the bottom of the seventh, you know, your fans are starting to clear out of the ballpark, but not if they've got a lucre contest going, right? Because they're focused on that next hit or they're focused on the next strikeout and they're sitting there with their friends and they're more engaged in the game. And we've seen, you know, the studies and done a bunch of the focus groups and people stay engaged in the game longer if they've got a few bucks on the line. And that's the big misconception. It doesn't have to be hundreds of dollars to get people excited. $5 or $10 can grab you back in. Um, so we've really leaned into, as you said, Wayne, making social the core of what we do. Uh, everything about our app is focused around groups. It's focused around the friends that you play with, the gamification, the smack talk, the head-to-head -head statistics, keeping it easy and keeping it fun um, over five or 10 bucks. And so I think that this is kind of phase one and I think where we're going is bringing this even more further into the stadium itself. And this is what's been so great about our investor base, um, you know, filled with team owners and other, and other athletes is why can't you bring this to the stadium? You know, Wayne and I are both basketball fans. Why can't we be at Madison Square Garden in a group of others on Lucra at Madison Square Garden and based on geolocation, share contests within that community that's right there. Create a fan experience at the game um, in a legal way through Lucra that's different than anything they've seen before. So we're really keen in on a lot of these different uh, points for us here. And social will remain the number one focus of Lucra. Um, it's not only our biggest differentiator, we also think it's what opens the market up. Um, you know, there's a couple million avid sports bettors in the US. There's probably close to 50 to 100 million sports fans. And so where's the disconnect? And we think it's social. Well, Matt, what are you, what are your thoughts about that? You know, social and, and and just all these years of you being in the in the industry, you know, right out of college, right to the sports betting industry, and now you have entrepreneurs like Dylan talking about social and social media and sharing all this information where it's been such a an industry where it was kind of closed and you weren't out telling people what you were doing, but now this is like sharing on Twitter and other social media networks. It's it's pretty wild, huh? I love where the industry is going in that regard, because let's face it, what were sports betting apps for the last seven, eight years? Transactional devices. I mean, you were just simply going on there to make a transaction, whether it was to place a wager, or make a withdraw or make a deposit. I mean, these were literally transactional devices. And we tend to have much less nefarious activity from people that are engaged in a social environment because they're just playing with their friends. They're trying to engage with the sport and have a good time. Well, at the end of the day, let's remember, we just had two separate states do over a billion dollars of handle in October alone. Over six states do over $500 million worth of handle in October alone. And we're in a country now where suddenly the numbers are going to be around 40 or $50 billion of handle legally wagered in the United States this year. And any time you have that amount of dollars wagered, you have that big of an ecosystem, especially one that's really new and still in its embryonic stage, you're going to have a lot of people trying to take advantage uh, on all sides, whether it's take advantage of the sports book, take advantage of regulations, take advantage of the consumer. And that's why it's so important, I think, and, and Dylan said it first, that we all be transparent, that we put integrity and compliance first. 
But at the end of the day, the social component's amazing. And it's probably where the industry is headed to how do we engage these people better in arena, on their couch or in arena. Um, and I think it's wonderful what Dylan and, and the team are doing over there. Well, Matt, you know, speaking of, of social, I think it also leads to the education side of the industry. And I know you've been a real leader in that. Um, we may want to talk about what you've done with Ohio University and their whole uh, sports betting program that you've done with them, but also just from education in general, just to, to really um, educating the the fan out there, the sports better on on just how to do this in a, in a responsible way. You know, it's amazing. And it's one of the things that I thought would be more of a hurdle than it has been is getting new players to engage in sports betting with the complexities of a point spread and what it means and what is the real theoretical hold. You know, I think if you go out and ask people on the streets, they assume that the sports books have a 10 percent hold because it's minus 110, minus 110. But at the end of the day, that equates to a 4.54 percent theoretical hold for the sports books on a minus 110 and minus 110 uh, point spread line. So understanding what the real hold percentage is, you know, what the sports books are offering, what are the what are the different numbers mean? I think that's the, you know, sort of the educational curve. So to this people play, they never feel like they're being taken advantage of. They they're able to enjoy lots of different wager types. The education component is so important. And for the sports books and the consumer to understand the rules, let's face it, crazy things happen in sports. We just had our first college basketball forfeiture yesterday, Washington versus Arizona, I mean, versus UCLA. What does that mean to a better? And all these different things that happen within a game, rainouts and baseball, pitching changes and change of venue, change of time. How does it affect the actual betters? You know, house rules are tricky. They're a little complicated. The more the better becomes educated, the less likely they are to have a poor customer experience and go, oh, I didn't know that happened, or I can't believe I didn't get my money back from that. Right. The more we can educate this base of betters, the better experience they're going to have, the less regulatory hurdles we're going to have to overcome. Yeah, and Wayne, I'll jump in too, because we're this is a huge part of what, of what we see at Lucra is the one of the biggest friction points is that first user experience of the first wager because it's you know the first time they've seen a lot of these terms and we're trying to simplify that's the word that we use if, if if a feature that we add doesn't make it simpler for someone to understand we don't add it right and so like that's a huge piece of the puzzle i think for the entire industry is the common fan they want a wager but they have that inertia or that, that barrier to entry because they, they get it's too complex or the parlay or the teaser or the vig or the juice and all these different you know, the jargon, just like finance, you know, uh, I used to work in investment banking and that jargon kind of, kind of scares people away as well. And so just making it more fun and approachable. Um, and, and, and as Matt says, once they are in and they understand that layer of trust and safety, it's, it's really there, especially with these like, you know, the lucra focused millennial, millennial focused apps They're They look and they feel like the Robin Hoods and the Venmos. And you know, were trying to build something that feels and looks safe to attract that, you know, younger customer who's new um, to the space. Well, I showed somebody last week at, at one of the conferences, Dylan, your your app. And the first right. thing the person said to me was, oh, my God, it's amazing. It looks like Instagram. Right. And so and I said and, I, and he's like and he's like, no, I, I and I go, no, you don't understand. Like, that's a compliment. And I can't wait to tell Dylan. Right. Um, you know, so so share with us, you know, how how it works on Lucre. If you want to have a wager, how, how does that work? Yeah. So I'll first by just appreciating that comment the goal for lucra is to be a social platform where wagering is the medium right it's not a sports betting platform with some social right so it's a really nice you know that's a great that's like you know you know i'd be happy about that because that's the type of comment that we want to hear so how it works on lucra is i pick a player i'm a huge uh, basketball fan so let's say i pick lebron james and then i get a plethora of stats available to me to wager on so points or free throws made that night or three pointers so let's say i choose three pointers I then, our, our backend matrix is automatically going to sift out all the options that don't make sense. So, for example, you're not going to bet LeBron James three-pointers against Tom Brady passing yards. That's not going to be a fair wager. So we're going to sift out the options that are pretty you know, unrealistic. You're then going to be able to choose your opponent's player. So I, you know, let's say I know Wayne's a Sixers fan. Maybe I'll choose Joel Embiid, right, and Joel Embiid three-pointers. And I'll then be able to share my contest, LeBron versus Embiid three-pointers, with anybody on the platform to the public feed of 37 states, to maybe this little panel group that we make, just the three of us, 
or directly to Wayne. We'll get a notification and in one click be able to accept. So, you know, we have like funny, some funny content coming out around how you're at, you're at dinner, but you're kind of quickly under the table just accepting a contest with a buddy. We want it to be that simple where you get a text message. A lot of it's done through SMS um, and you click one button and you accept. The money gets escrowed on our platform. So there's no more chasing your friends down for money on Mondays after the after a football Sunday game. Um, and the money's escrowed and the real-time data flows in from our sports data provider. Um, and then when the contest is complete, you get paid out. So it's really efficient. It's very clean. Um, and, it's, and it's really easy to use and it's trustworthy. And so that's a big part of what, of what we're trying to build. Uh, it's really exciting to hear what you're doing. I mean, in, from your perspective, I mean, you're, you're in touch with all major sports betting operators. And as you said, not only in touch with them, they're all clients and, and, and customers of U.S. Integrity. What are you hearing from them? What are you hearing from other entrepreneurs in the sports betting industry from a technology perspective? Like what's next? What's going to really blow people's minds? Well, I think we've been hearing about the evolution of in-play betting for more than a decade now. I remember at Cantor Gaming back in 2010, we took sort of the first stab at U.S. in-play wagering. But the biggest disconnect has always been the lack of a sync between what the viewer is watching and the odds that are being placed to them on the betting app. You know, I, I'm watching the odds move and, oh, you know, yeah, he's going to hit that three-pointer. Oh, no, here comes a home run. And I would see it on my betting app prior. And then because the market's shifting at a time where I'm not synced up as i go to put bets in that time is different it's moving the, the odds are constantly shifting i go to put a bet in odds change please sorry try again i uh, go to put another bet in odds change please sorry try i do it three or four times and i give up it was such a poor user experience that when everyone pointed to the european models and said look they do 70 percent in play how come the U.S. is doing one and a half percent in play? It's because it was such a poor in play experience. But suddenly what we're seeing is better sync, faster data, cleaner data. And that in play experience is finally being cleaned up to the point where that vision everybody had of watching a game and betting on the next play run pass. Will they fair catch the punt? Will he make or miss the field goal is actually coming to life right in front of us. Regulators are approving these wagers. Customers are having a better experience wagering and participating, and the sync has finally been sort of synced up, I guess, to use the right word, um, that I think that's going to be the next sort of big boom is, is finally, I know everyone's been saying it for 10 years, but I think we're finally at a place where the technology is going to allow in-play wagering in the U.S. to take off. It's, it's awesome to hear you say that because I couldn't agree more. And that you think about the problem that it's a big problem in just wagering. Now layer on peer-to-peer. -peer. That's really difficult, right? And so this is something we've been working on for over a year is peer-to-peer -peer live wagering, which we're excited to be launching in early January here. So it's, it's really something we've been fired up about. But it adds an entirely new layer of complexity is that time gap is a real thing because you have to have somebody on the other side of the wager. We found a really cool solution. Um, we're launching it in different layers. Um, but that's really, I think, what our fans, we ask our fans. We did tons of focus groups and customer surveys. What do you want? They said, we want to wager during the game. You know, who hits the next three pointer? Who makes the next free throw? Uh, who's going to have more points for the second half? And like that increases the continued flow of wagers on your platform and also keeps you engaged because there's no bad time to make a wager then, right? Doesn't matter what the score is, doesn't matter what's going on in your previous wager. You can start fresh with somebody new right then and there. So I agree with Matt completely. Live betting, I think, is going to become a huge, huge part of the handle and the engagement. And, you know, you're going to start seeing kiosks at the game at the back of your seat. You're going to be able to swipe to the right for a pass, swipe to the left for a run. And you're going to win your money and then get to spend it on beers or hot dogs at the stadium with your credits. It's just it's all going to be integrated, um, which is so exciting as a consumer. Like I, I get, you know, goosebumps thinking about it because it's going to make going to the game so much more fun. Well, I think one of the big things that's going to tie all this together is is the it, companies like what yours, Dylan, um, certainly Matt on your end to make sure that things are all across the, uh, you know, on the up and up. And then companies that are doing things around, you know, augmented reality and using, you know, new types of um, media companies that are now bringing in different types of, um, you know, immersive, you know, video into this into this world i mean and and then be able to tie all this together this was really complicated stuff years ago but dylan today this is just this is what, yeah. we, what we deal with it's all about the integration like you said you know we've been talking previously about some of the stuff going on with fubo and how i should be able to sit and watch my 
game, right? And why is there not live betting options for me right during that game that I have a little control or I can speak to the TV and say, you know, um, you know, I'll take the Lions plus three here, right? And so that's all coming. It's all the different pieces are now being built. Innovation's happening like on these different spots. And as you said, it's now these partnerships are getting really exciting to bring this all together um, because there's a lot of synergistic relationships out there. So um, it's quite exciting time to be in the space. I'm sure Matt feels the same way. It's uh, chaotic is the right word that he used. It's it's been mayhem because um, things are changing so fast, but there's so much opportunity, um, and that's why it's been a lot of fun. Well, take it a step further. A guy makes a ten dollar bet on something as simple like the Arizona Cardinals to win their Super Bowl at a hundred to one. They win the Super Bowl, and all in one experience, he can have his bet an NFT of the moment the Arizona Cardinals win the Super Bowl. Oh yeah, and the jersey of his favorite player, Kyler Murray all in this one package, sitting from his couch with his remote control, that's the ultimate fan engage experience. And I think we're almost there. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's it's gonna be really cool. And I think that what's also very cool is that who is sitting on that couch is changing too. The demographic yes. of the user is really changing. We're seeing over 15% women on Luca right now, and that's growing. Um, and I just think there's a huge opportunity for just common sports fans to engage in this type of stuff. Um, with all this new kind of cool ways to drive people in. And so it's been really cool to see that change happening. And I think that's a change that I'm hoping we're also still in the first inning of, right? In terms of the demographic shifting and who's playing and the age brackets and uh, so on and so forth. So um, a very cool time. Yeah, I mean, maybe share a little bit more of that as we start to wrap up on this, on our um, Sports Tech Nation Summit here. Um, I mean, Dylan, I mean, you talk about the demographics, you know, sort of changing, meaning, you know, more women now betting on sports. I mean, wh how, what do you think it is? I mean, so it's clear the NFL shares their data um, that 40 percent of NFL fans are women. Right. You know, almost one out of every two. So it's crazy that such a small percentage of women are then betting on sports as well. And I think that a lot of it, when we, when we survey a lot of women, uh, my partner, Hannah, obviously, um, is a woman who has worked at the NFL. So she's kind of right in the middle of that um, conversation. Uh, it really comes down to approachability and social. It's like the two things that we hear. It's, you know, make this more fun, make it more approachable. You know, the education piece that Matt was talking about and that you had mentioned kind of all tie into the fact that, like, it needs to be a little bit more millennialized and a little bit more approachable to get, you know, more common fans on the platform. So it's something that we've kind of had as one of our core pillars, something that I still think we can do better at that we'll continue to iterate on and something that other players in the space are starting to pick up on as well. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of high income uh, women out there who are great target customers um, that aren't being targeted. I mean, look at the advertising in, in, in sports betting. It's definitely male dominated. Um, and that's also a mistake. And so just the entire way that businesses are going to be branded and marketed, um, I think is something that's really changing and something that we're trying to be at the forefront of is just, just being an approachable platform. Um, and I think what's nice about something social is you invite your friends. So like, you know, I can invite my wife to play. She invites her friends and her friends invite their guy friends. And it's this nice circular loop of just people who love sports, um, regardless of gender. And it's not just the demographic who's playing, but it's some of it has to do with the fact that due to all the streaming networks now, we now have the availability to watch all these women's yeah. sports. Throw on ESPN Plus and you'll see women's volleyball, women's soccer, you know, all these different things basically on a daily basis. The WNBA where, you know, 20 years ago, you were a slave to basically whatever was on cable. And there are were, there were only a limited amount of time slots and channels and viewing experiences available. So thus they predominantly went to the men's sports. But now because you can watch women's softball, women's volleyball, women's tennis, you're more likely to wager on it. And I think all of the available streaming is, has been a big help and boost to that. Definitely. Well, there's certainly no doubt about that. Um, I know we have a very tight timetable here um, to get back to the, the whole – big conference that's going on, the Sports Tech Nation Summit. I really appreciate both of you guys taking the time to come on and be part of the show. We've had Matthew Holt, the CEO of U.S. Integrity, Dylan Robbins, the CEO of Lucre Sports, and hopefully to everyone out there all around the world, you've learned something today. You've certainly heard from two of the best entrepreneurs who were truly building the future of the sports betting industry. So, uh, Matt, Dylan, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Wayne. Thanks, guys. Pleasure, Pleasure as always. Everyone. Thank you.